Hello, I'm Judith Broadhead, and I am an associate professor of English here at North Central College. And today I'm going to be talking about the invisible pandemic. And by that, I mean the pandemic of 1918 and 1919. So it happened uh, about 102 years ago. And in many ways, it resembled the kind of pandemic that we are going through uh, right now. When scholars of American, English, and Irish literature uh, consider what was produced in the years following 1918 up until about 1939, they call that the interwar years and sometimes call it interwar literature. They have often assumed that the spirit of the time, the zeitgeist, was molded primarily by World War I. However, there is something else, of course, terribly important that happened in those years, and that was uh, the pandemic. When you look at this photograph, which is of some people in Australia um, in uh, 1918, you'll notice something that looks quite similar to what we're going through right now. People are wearing masks. And uh, something probably none of us would have picked up on a few years ago, we see that the lady in the buttoned up coat is not wearing hers properly. She has hers uh, below her nose. Um, so now we're conscious of those small details and we will probably notice them as we look through artifacts um, of the period and think about how uh, that pandemic was reflected in art and literature of the time or where it doesn't seem to show up at all. Uh, by the way, in Australia, about 400,000 soldiers were sent from there to fight in the war and about 60,000 of them died. So they had a very high casualty uh, rate in Australia despite the fact that it was so far away from where the fighting was being done. And they also, just like so many countries in the world, were strongly affected by the pandemic. Here's a, uh, a map of the globe in um, 1918 and 1919. And you'll see something that's quite important to the study of this pandemic that there were three waves. Even now we hear discussion of whether or not we're going to have a, a, a second wave. But the first wave was in the spring and summer of 1918. Then a second wave came through from uh, summer through winter in that same year. And the worst months seemed to be uh, in the fall. And then a third wave, which was uh, not quite as bad in January through July of of 19, uh, 1919. And you can see it's all over the world. Since Africa and Asia were so heavily colonized by countries in Europe like uh, Great Britain, Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, they drew from those colonies for people who would help in the war effort, sometimes uh, conscripting them, meaning drafting them. They were taken um, without uh, their choice, and sometimes they were recruited. Um, as these soldiers returned to their home countries, um, they returned with influenza and uh, generally started in various ports and then moved along the, the train lines as people traveled, uh, traveled to their homes. Another artifact that we can look at uh, besides photographs or looking at documents that were created later on like, like maps are newspapers. And this is an image of the front page of the Seattle Washington Daily Times in October of 1918. It's an important month. And you'll see there are huge headlines Churches, schools, shows closed, public um, assemblies are banned. Uh, that sounds pretty familiar. Notice at the top of the page, um, there is a message from the Surgeon General 
uh, another message from the state health commissioner. There's still the kinds of people that we are looking to for advice during a pandemic. And what is the advice from the health commissioner? Don't get into crowds. Don't cough or sneeze without using a handkerchief. Get plenty of fresh air. And when the symptoms of a cold appear, isolate yourself as far as possible from others. Uh, the suggestions were pretty much the same ones that we hear now. Wash your hands, uh, wear a mask, um, stay away from other people as, as much as you can. And notice on this front page that the coverage of the war and of the pandemic are, are uh, competing on this page. On the left-hand side, we see news about the war. On the right-hand side, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, we see news about the uh, pandemic. And on the right-hand side, we see news about the, the war. In another newspaper from a little bit closer to us, uh, the Wisconsin State Journal, which was based in Madison, Wisconsin, the capital of the state, we see the same sort of thing. But in this case, the pandemic news is um, on the uh, right, the war news is on the left, and in the middle we have the sad case of a, uh, a doughboy, a soldier, who survived the war and uh, died of influenza. That was not an uncommon story, and of course um, many men uh, died uh, not long after battles of influenza. The first time that I saw an extensive uh, treatment of the 1918 pandemic was in this article by Malcolm Gladwell, which was published in 1997 in The New Yorker. You probably know Malcolm Gladwell's name. He's written um, lots of uh, very successful best-selling uh, books over the past uh, 20 or 25 years. Um, but here he writes an article about the pandemic and he wonders why it doesn't show up in literature. He quotes Alfred Crosby, who is an author who wrote a, a book about the pandemic, who said the average college graduate born since 1918 literally knows more about the Black Death of the 14th century than the World War I pandemic. And um, again, Gladwell is thinking about Crosby's writing and says he offers a number of explanations for this. In the end, though, he concludes that the virus is figurative disappearance is of a piece with its literal disappearance, that we don't remember it because we can't find it. So what Gladwell is arguing here and that Crosby argued in, um, in his book, and Crosby's book was first published in 1976, that because it doesn't show up in, in literature, people don't know about it. They are not reminded of it. They can't forget about the wars, but they can't remember the pandemic. So very recently, the author Elizabeth Outka published a book called Viral Modernism, The Influenza Pandemic and Interwar Literature. And as I've mentioned, interwar means from about 1918 to 1939, so between World War I and uh, World War II. And I think when she uh, wrote this book, she didn't realize how quite how timely it, it would be. So she's been called on to also write about the, the current pandemic and, and compare her own research. So in an article in the Paris Review, she wrote in April, what seemed far-fetched yesterday arrives tomorrow. The past is always another country, but the speed at which knowledge becomes outdated, naivete turns to realization, and basic truths change is dizzying during a pandemic. And I think we all can understand what that means when things seem to change uh, day by day. She looks at a number of authors, and one of the authors she takes a look at is T.S. Eliot. So if you've studied American or English poetry of the early 20th century, you no doubt have encountered Eliot. Here he's pictured with his first wife, Vivienne, whom he married in 1915. 
And although they didn't have a very happy marriage, um, they started out well enough. But in 1918, they both developed uh, serious cases of influenza. Vivian was never completely well after that, although it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily clear that the um, influenza that she suffered from was what uh, caused many of her uh, later um, mental health and physical health problems. But just think about that title, The Wasteland. It is uh, certainly seems uh, depressing. Eliot himself has said that it was really more about his own mental state more than the, the state of the world. But it certainly resonated at the time, and, and no doubt the fact that people were had been suffering from the war and then from the pandemic on top of that um, helped or has helped make that poem last. So The Wasteland, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, is not an easy poem. It is... A, uh, a difficult one. It is complicated. It's almost impenetrable um, without annotations. And Eliot tried to create his, or he did create his own annotations for the poem. And then um, many literature students over the decades have had to add their own annotations. And notice he begins by saying, unreal city under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a, a, clou a crowd flowed over Linden Bridge, so many I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet. Then on the second column there, he goes on to uh, jump around and says, you who are with me in the ships at Mylai, he's talking about ancient Phoenicia, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Corpses in the garden? You, hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frere. He's, he's quoting uh, Baudelaire, the French imagist poet. So he's jumping all over from um, eons before and uh, jumping from language to language. It's, it's fragmentary. It is uh, disjointed. And Outka argues that this, um, this, this mix of things may actually reflect the sort of mental state that people found themselves in after suffering a severe case of, of influenza where they had a hard time um, organizing their thoughts and feeling as though, um, really feeling as though their brains were working properly again. Another author who um, is of the same period, uh, the Irish poet W.B. Yeats, you probably know him as somebody who started by writing beautiful lyric poetry like the Lake Isle of Inishvree and then wrote very political poetry like Easter 1916, um, but also as a, as a mature poet wrote really brutal verse, some of which seem to um, signal really dangerous, almost apocalyptic times ahead. Um, Yeats was 52 when he married his wife Georgie. She was only 25. And the frightening thing about the pandemic for him was that she was pregnant with their first child, Anne, whom we see on the left. Um, and that was a, a very frightening thing because pregnant women were so uh, vulnerable. Uh, so many women died during the pandemic and uh, left children um, behind who were motherless. Sometimes both young parents died and then they became orphans. And of course, this is something uh, Yates was terribly afraid of. She did survive, um, but barely, uh, as the descriptions say. And uh, the poem that he wrote in 1919, while the pandemic was still going and he had uh, a new baby, was The Second Coming. And I'm going to read a little bit from that. 
Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed. And everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. So it's certainly not a uh, a very optimistic poem. Um, the, the second coming sounds like something horrific. It sounds like a, a terrible, uh, a terrible future. And this too, like the wasteland, seem to symbolize the the modernist idea of where the world was going, which did not seem as though it was going to be anything very positive. So Outka writes that he composes his poem in the immediate aftermath of his pregnant wife's near fatal attack. And the poem captures the raw chaotic quality of the experience depicting at once an epic universal cataclysm that also unfolds internally as a bodily cataclysm. And this is something she's going to emphasize in the book that the, the personal experience of these writers does get reflected in their poetry and their novels. She also talks about uh, occasional artists and that although we, we may take it as the spirit of the time, it often was both very, very personal and, and something that could be applied to the larger world. Here's an example of an artist that Outka mentions, and you no doubt will recognize Edvard Munch, and uh, he's a Norwegian artist. These poem, these, uh, sorry, these paintings are both in museums in Norway, and these are self-portraits, and he's very explicit in his treatment of the Spanish flu. The one on the left is called Self-Portrait with the Spanish flu, so he still has it and the one on the right self-portrait after the Spanish flu. And there are a number of other self-portraits on the same theme. But uh, what art critics have noticed about the painting on the left, especially one named James C. Harris, who notes that the color of the wall and the color of his face are almost the same. They're quite red, perhaps even feverish, that the rumpled Bed covers look as though it's somebody who uh, had tossed and, and turned. I would say it also could be someone who gets out of bed and really doesn't have the energy to straighten up the bedclothes before he uh, sits in a chair. He's wearing blankets over his uh, lap. And um, his face is almost, uh, almost faded looking, and his mouth is also in that O. But this is not an O of a scream. Uh, Harris says this is an O of somebody who seems to be barely able to uh, function. On the right, he looks a little bit more defined. His, his features are um, better delineated. Um, at least he, he seems to be standing, but he certainly still looks like a, like a beaten man. And that's how Munch described the influence is making him feel. Here's another quite famous author, the first female author we'll be talking about, which is Virginia Woolf in a lovely photograph on the left. Um, that's a few years before um, 1918. And on the right, you see her with her husband, Leonard Woolf. Um, Virginia Woolf's mother was a photographer and she also knew lots of photographers. That's the reason why there's so many beautiful portraits of her. 
Mrs. Dalloway is a, uh, a novel that uh, many people read when they're studying um, English literature. And perhaps they also will take a look at uh, some of her essays. Um, and she has one on, on being ill and uh, what that's like. Um, and she also left behind in her diary some accounts of the months in 1918 and in October. This is about the fourth or fifth time that October 1918 has uh, popped up. She criticizes the newspaper, the London Times, um, and praises it as well and says, yes, it is. they are quite accurately comparing it, meaning the influenza to the plague, but uh, the times she mocks trembles because they fear it might lead to a premature peace. Um, so um, she uh, is, is thinking that maybe the, the London Times has some kind of vested interest in wanting the, the war to continue, maybe so they can sell more newspapers or it's something dramatic that they can always write about, or perhaps they're big supporters of the, the, the government. Um, but uh, th there is something to this. Um, the, uh, it, it's very possible that the pandemic did have an influence on um, ending the war more, um, more quickly than it, than it might have, as both sides were uh, completely exhausted. Mrs. Dalloway is about someone who seems to be suffering from influenza, although Outka mentions that it's often not read that way. Um, Wolf herself suffered terribly from influenza, and not just the one in 1918. She had a, um, uh, a predilection for getting influenza, and of course, just like now, there were different ones every year, and she had it a couple of times before 1918. She had it, I think, a, a few times after 1918, and she was... Um, so susceptible to it that her doctors tried to think of things they could do that would make her less vulnerable, including um, pulling some of her teeth, which sounds like a, a terrible uh, remedy. And she writes about, as Outka mentions, the lingering physical and psychological damage the virus could inflict months and years after the attack. Now we come to an, another uh, woman writer, Catherine Ann Porter, who is American, and this is a little bit later. Uh, still in the interwar years, or at the very end of them in 1939. Of course, in the United States, um, it's still pre-World War II because we don't enter uh, the war until December 1941. Um, this is an illustration that was used in uh, the New York Review of Books. It's called The Racetrack Death on a Pale Horse. The, the idea of the pale horse um, comes from the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and uh, each one of them is assigned a color. This is a you know, biblical um, allegory. The pale horse is, uh, is the plague, is, is death. And the red horse is war, the white horse is the conqueror, and the black horse symbolizes famine. And so here, that's why we're, we're seeing the, the pale horse. Here is the cover of one of the editions of her book. And this is a signet um, paperback, and again, an, an artifact of the time. And what's uh, interesting about it is it has sort of a pulp fiction look and uh, the kind of illustration you might expect on a, I don't know, a, a murder mystery or a, or a bodice ripper. And there's a particular kind of style that the signet paperbacks um, in, encourage. And, and here we see a soldier from World War I looking down at the uh, woman he loves. This is Miranda and Adam. Um, and Think about that pose that we see them in, because you're going to see that uh, pose again in other um, um, in other dramatic works. And uh, ironically, in this novella, which is very explicitly about influenza, and one of the few books that is, 
it is Miranda who is first ill and very ill and she survives and then Adam who is the soldier returned from war um, is the person she gives it to and he does not survive. Uh, another very different um, interpretation of uh, influenza is that seen in the works of H.P. Lovecraft. And you might know his name as somebody who is a, a bit of a, a cult figure as a, uh, a writer. In the um, early 20th century, people like Sir Conan Doyle, who wrote all of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, um, was very interested in spiritualism. And that was also true of lots of other uh, authors who were in, uh, in England and Ireland as, as well as in the United States. So Sir uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's son um, was in the Battle of the Somme. And as uh, I record this on July 1st, it's the anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, which was a terrible, extremely bloody battle in which thousands and thousands of uh, young men died. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle's son was wounded. He was 25, but he succumbed to influenza, actually pneumonia as a result of influenza. And um, Arthur Conan Doyle never quite got over it as parents of children who have died uh, often never do. And one of the reasons he was interested in seances and spiritualism was that he thought he could um, be comforted by some kind of image of his son returning. However, Lovecraft took this idea in a different direction, and he, um, after suffering from influenza, um, drew on uh, the delirium that was often produced by uh, the disease and imagined monsters and zombies. Now, he's a little bit problematic, I think, for uh, those of us who look back at the literature of the time because his writing um, conflates the, uh, the disease um, as something that's brought in by immigrants or that immigrants, hordes of immigrants, are going to infect the Anglo-Saxon uh, genetic lines in the United States, and that um, immigration is, is something that is uh, dangerous for the country. And um, he also uh, turns his images of disease into, uh, into zombies. Um, Outka notes that Lovecraft unleashes in his story elements that other pandemic accounts employed, taking the survivor's guilt, the physical suffering, the contagion anxiety, the burial fears, and the pain of an invisible enemy, and animating them all into excessive monstrous forms. So um, it'll be interesting to see how uh, comic book writers, graphic novelists, filmmakers, animators um, use our current pandemic and, and what sort of monstrous figures they think come out of uh, come out of this. So let's take a look at some of the other um, evidence of uh, the pandemic that show up uh, a little bit later. And as I mentioned, we don't see too much of it in the literature that was written at the time or even in the next uh, 20 years. And Outka says sometimes it does take a while for it to show up. However, by 1974, um, it, it did show up um, in historical dramas of the era. And after about 1974 or five, um, it, it's really not forgotten again. It's almost always inserted. But notice that these things are written um, uh, sometimes nearly 50 years or 80 years or 100 years after um, they first occurred. So Upstairs, Downstairs was a very popular historical drama. It was on uh, the BBC in England, and it was on Masterpiece Theatre. It ran for years. It was about a wealthy family who lived upstairs, and the people who worked for them, their servants who worked uh, downstairs. Um, Critics, on the whole, think that this is a fairly successful use of um, 
influenza as a plot point because they do have it intersect with the war. And Hazel is um, has been Mr. Bellamy's secretary, and she marries the son of the house. You see him here, James. Um, and uh, uh, James had been a, sort of a silly playboy of a, of a son. And then, of course, uh, as happened to so many people, he's a soldier in World War I. He is never quite the same uh, afterwards. This marriage is, is troubled, and um, Hazel dies of influenza. And uh, the way they put it together with the war is that on Armistice Day, which just as it is now, we see it as Veterans Day, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, so November 11th, they go to Hazel's funeral rather than celebrating with the rest of the country who were so happy that the war was over. Um, several decades later, we have Downton Abbey, which has a lot of the same similar themes, the um, sort of the upstairs crowd and the downstairs crowd. Here we have Matthew Crawley and his mother Isabel and his fiance Lavinia. Um, however, everybody who follows this uh, kind of a high-class soap opera knows that it's not Lavinia who really should be uh, Matthew's wife. It really should be Mary, the, the woman that he really needs to marry. So what are they going to do with the plot? Of course, here we've seen this, this uh, image a couple of times already. They, uh, they give Lavinia influenza and her, uh, her worried fiance um, watches over her. Before she expires, she uh, tells him he is free to marry Mary, and it's it's okay. Um, he she will not haunt him. And then on the right we see Matthew and Mary, and that's who she really uh, she really should uh, be with. That's uh, a way to move the plot along while giving a nod to uh, something that is uh, a historical. Uh, historical uh, reality. Um, some people, though, looking at this episode, thought, you know, this is just doesn't seem to be quite right, that this is not particularly realistic. Nobody else in the family seems worried that they will catch it, which is, of course, what really happened. If And just as we would worry now, if somebody in your family has uh, COVID-19, the first thing you're going to worry about is who else might get affected. And we all think about that all the time. It's why we are not seeing our grandparents. It's why we're distancing. It's why we're wearing masks. It's why we're washing our hands. Um, and in, in this drama, the house, the big house, the beautiful big house, had already been a convalescent hospital for soldiers. So in reality, if it had been that, um, the influenza probably would already have... Uh, reach that household, it uh, probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't have been able to escape. Okay, uh, later, and this is a little bit more recent, in 2014, another British drama written by Susan Phelps um, was called Crimson Field, and this is about World War I as well. Um, instead of focusing so much on soldiers or battles, this one focuses on the nurses and the VADs, the volunteer corps of young unmarried women who had to be 23 or over. Um, it's at a field hospital in France, and they deal with uh, terrible wounds and burns and amputations, but something else they have to deal with that affects the nurses as well as the uh, soldiers is influenza, and it's a, it's a terrible worry and, of course, results in uh, it results in some deaths, which is uh, fairly, fairly realistic. So, um, what is missing from the kind of literature that we have looked at? Um, I mentioned at the beginning that there were um, so many soldiers who came from India, who came from Ghana, who came from Nigeria, or people who were conscripted to work in the in the war effort for both sides of this um, conflict. And 
there is not much literature in English about uh, those people, or at least not literature that has been reflected in American and Irish and, uh, and, and English literature. And it's not literature that is, um, shows up in Outka's book. She does mention also that uh, something that is uh, not addressed in the literature of the interwar period, or at least she is not, uh, doesn't have time to address, is what happened to African Americans during the pandemic. There's a wonderful article. It's written for um, a, uh, a medical journal called uh, Public Health by Vanessa Northington Gamble, who is African-American, who is both an MD and, and has a PhD. And she writes an article called, There Wasn't a Lot of Comforts in Those Days. And it's about um, trying to figure out exactly what happened to African-Americans who suffered from influenza in that period. What was so difficult for them was that the um, the period of 1918, 1919 was a was a very very difficult period for African Americans in American history. Um, it was um, Jim Crow. Um, it was anti-immigrant um, segregation was legal. There was lots of anti-black violence. There was uh, lynching. There were a white supremacist. Uh, the KKK was pretty active in in that era in the United States, even as uh, locally as in uh, Northern Illinois in that in that period. And um, not surprisingly, the pandemic was very hard on people who uh, had fewer resources. They also were not welcome in most hospitals. They had to create separate hospitals and, as she says, separate facilities and um, make plans to take care of themselves. There were so many barriers to African-American uh, care in those days that uh, that is a, a story that really is not completely told and uh, would be a, a great subject for more study. So, in conclusion, what are we to think of this? And uh, what are we to think of the way the pandemic is uh, reflected in uh, literature? And, and how will the pandemic that we are going through right now be reflected in, in art, in literature, in drama, in film? Well, we don't know that yet. Illness is a subject that is harder to write about than war. There are no clean beginnings and clean endings. Um, there is so much that is unknown. People will be arguing for a long time about uh, where it began, and we, will, we won't know uh, when it ends, for uh, probably for quite some time. The experience of undergoing it is very unsettling, it was unsettling in 1918 and 1919, and it's unsettling for us now. For those of us going through it now, I, I think we will always link this uh, experience of uh, disease with the upheaval that we see around us. We see the economy shaken in just a few months, everybody's schedules upended, all of our comforting routines are smashed, um, at this unnerving moment when we naturally want to be together with our loved ones, we're forbidden from doing that. And the last thing we want to do is bring uh, disease to the people we love the most. People have lost their jobs and their livelihoods overnight and not in a way that probably uh, could have been predicted. Um, if we could have predicted it, I don't, I'm not sure that would have uh, been better, but maybe we would have been able to plan for it. Surely there is a connection between the fears people have around the world about catching COVID-19, which robs its victims of the ability to breathe, and the fact that the Black Lives Matter protests, which have been spurred by the 
horrifying videos of the murder of George Floyd and other victims of uh, brutality have occurred in countless cities, suburbs, small towns, including this one, and in cities around the world. It's really quite a phenomenon. Um, we all know what it is to be afraid that you cannot breathe. And um, that is something I think that this pandemic has uh, helped us to understand. The energy of the protests um, seems to be giving people purpose, though, and the cause is providing them with direction at a time when that's something we crave. I think those of us who are alive now will be telling our grandchildren about the 2019-2020 pandemic and the fight for an end to systematic or I should say systemic racism. And that is something that we hope we can work on and eliminate. Thank you for listening.